I, is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Shia and Yinda, who will be presenting about fine grained complexity uh, for dynamic graph problems. So, to give a little bit of background and setup for this talk, so far in all the tutorial talks, we've been talking primarily about how to get fast algorithms, different techniques for designing different sorts of algorithms. Um, but sadly, sometimes when we try to design fast algorithms, we can't always get as efficient runtimes as we want. Sometimes there are real inherent barriers towards it. And one of the recurring themes that might occur in some of the workshops and some of the talks later is a variety of work that has happened on identifying some of these barriers and understanding the complexity of a variety of different problems. Um, there was a longer series of talks on fine grain complexity in the workshop last week, but we thought it would be a good idea to have at least one lecture on it on this, given the different ways it could intersect our program, and to get a sense of some of the particular uh, work in fine grain complexity that might be particularly relevant to this program. Um, so Yin Zhang very kindly agreed to give a joint uh, talk on this topic to get us all up to speed. And I'll turn it over to them. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction. So as mentioned, there were four lectures on fine-grained complexity last week. And this talk is built upon some of these talks. We would like to thank Virginia for many of these slides. So as theoretical computer scientists, we are interested in how fast we can solve fundamental problems uh, in the worst case. And ideally, we want very efficient algorithms. Right? You want, uh, say, you want linear time algorithms for many of the problems we're interested in. And the good news is that there is a huge toolbox of algorithmic techniques to solve these problems. And, and many fa fundamental problems can be solved very fast <coughs> using these techniques, such as MaxFlow. And on the other hand, there are still problems whose current best running time is essentially exhaustive search, just to try all possible solutions. And it's interesting to know how fast we can um, beat the exhaustive search running time. But for many fundamental problems, the current best is still essentially uh, exhaust exhaustive search or brute force. And um, so these are hard problems. For these problems, all known techniques get, techniques get stuck. And they are often um, important problems from diverse areas. And the algorithms for them are simple, often exhaustive search, and uh, taught in textbooks. And because they're exhaustive search, they are um, often too slow uh, in practice. So one example hard problem is the k-set problem. Here we are given n variables and a CNF formula. And the formula is an end of n clauses, and each clause is a O of k literals. Each literal is a variable or the negation of a variable. Uh, and we need to output yes if there is a Boolean assignment uh, that satisfies this formula and no otherwise. And the exhaustive search algorithm tries all two to the n combinations of all the um, assignments and runs in roughly two to the n time. And the current best known algorithm runs in two to the n minus uh, cn over k times m to the d time for some constant c and d. And as k grows, this running time approaches two to the n. So essentially, as k grows, there's uh, essentially no better than exhaustive search algorithm. And so far, no two to the n to the one minus epsilon time algorithm is known for positive epsilon. Another example is the longest common subsequence problem. Here we are given two strings with at most n characters, and let's say all the characters are ATGC. And the task is to find a subsequence of both strings that has maximum length. And this problem has applications in both computational biology and uh, spell trackers. <coughs> so the textbook algorithm for it, it runs in n square time, which is dynamic programming. And the current best algorithm is slightly faster, runs in n square over log square n time. Um, however, we want to solve uh, this problem on large inputs, uh, such as human genome. And in these cases, even n square running time, even though it's polynomial time, it will still be too slow in practice. And so far, there's no uh, n squared to the one minus epsilon time algorithm known for this problem. Well, we would like to know why we are getting stuck, and also um, want to know whether we are stuck because of the same reason. And the goal of fine complexity is to explain uh, this type of problem. Question. So here's today's plan. Uh, first, I will briefly uh, mention uh, some traditional hardness in complexity theory, and then show how to 
mimic the traditional approach in a fine-grained way, and that will be the fine-grained approach. And then we will focus on dynamic graph problems, which is one of the core topics in this program as an example uh, uh, sh to show that how to apply fine-grain complexity in, some type of, in this type of problem. And finally, so we'll talk about some uh, concrete example lower bound constructions. So k-set, we know k-set is hard because it's np-hard, right? And if k-set, we know that if k-set has a polytime algorithm for some k at least three, then p equals np. So uh, under the widely believed conjecture that p is not equal to np, uh, we can conclude that k-set does not have a polytime algorithm. So this is some conditional hardness. Right? Condition on the conjecture that p is not equal to np, uh, k-set requires super polynomial time. And this framework uh, can be used to show super polynomial lower bounds, conventional lower bounds for uh, all the MP hard problems. However, the, uh, the barrier is that we cannot use this framework to show some problem which already has polynomial running time to be hard. So we cannot use it to show problems like, such as LCS um, to explain why LCS is hard. And in other words, MP hard hardness is too coarse grained for our purpose. Um, in theoretical computer science, we often think polynomial time running time as efficient, and this is uh, for a variety of good reasons. For one, um, we can compose two polynomial time run, uh, polynomial time algorithms to get another polynomial time algorithm, and also the polynomial running times are preserved. Uh, even if we change the model. So uh, even, no matter what, whether the model is Turing machine or real random access machine, um, polynomial running times will still be polynomial running times. However, we will not consider n to the 100 time algorithm to be efficient in practice. And the one n is huge, uh, even n squared is inefficient sometimes. That's why we want a fine-grained theory of hardness that uh, mimics NP-hardness, but we Want, to, want, want this theory to be applicable to concrete polynomial running times. So on the left, uh, this is uh, how we show super polynomial conditional lower bound for MP hard problems. So let's mimic them. So first we want some hardness hypothesis. Traditionally we assume that P not equal to MP or that requires super polynomial time. But now we want some uh, more concrete uh, running time lower bound. So now we want to assume that some hard problem um, H requires close to H n time uh, on input of size n. And here we also have to fix a model and let's say we fix the model to be a random access machine. And we want to design fine grain reductions in order to show the following type of statements. We want to show that uh, if for some problem Q, there is a much faster than Q n time algorithm then that will impl imply a much faster than H n time algorithm for, for the problem H. And combining one and two, we can conclude that um, Q must require uh, Q n to the one minus little o one time uh, on the RAM model, condition on the hypothesis in the first bullet point. Okay. So I will explain each of these three aspects in more details uh, next. So first we want some uh, hypotheses. Right. So previously we assumed set requires super polynomial time, but in fact, set is conjectured to be uh, harder than that. Uh, more specifically, the strong exponential time hypothesis states that for any epsilon greater than zero, there exists some k such that k set on variables and m clauses cannot be solved in two to the n times one minus epsilon times poly m time. So essentially, uh, there's no two to the 0 0.999 times n time algorithm for k set for arbitrary k. And we can use this as our hardness hypothesis. And know that it's much stronger than p not equal to np, because here the conjecture lower bound is much higher than super, just super polynomial. And besides this, there are three other commonly used hypotheses about the three sum OV and APSP problems, which I will mention in a moment. In the 3 problem, we're given a set S of n numbers, and we want to answer whether there are three numbers that sum up to zero. 
And it's an easy exercise to get n square time algorithm for this problem. And the current best running time is n square over log square n for both integer inputs and real inputs. And the three sum hypothesis states that um, for the three sum problem, there is no polynomially faster than n square time algorithm. Orthogonal vector, in the orthogonal vector problem, we are given a set S of n vectors in dimension D for some D that's omega log n. And all the vectors have uh, zero one coordinates. Uh, we want to uh, answer whether there are two vectors that are orthogonal. The brute force algorithm runs in n square times D time just by checking every pair of vectors. And the current best known upper bound is n to the two minus theta one over log d over log n. So when d is order log n, um, this running time is uh, polynomially faster than n square. But when d is omega log n, this becomes n to the two minus little one. So still not be polynomially better than n squared. So the orthogonal vector hypothesis states that this problem requires n to the two minus little one time. Uh, and uh, it's known that SAS implies this hypothesis. And finally, for the APSP problem, we are given an node weighted graph and we need to find pairwise distances. There are several classical algorithms that run in n cube time, and current best running time is n to the uh, n cube over exponential in square root log n. And the APSP hypothesis is that this problem requires essentially n cube time. So, uh, if you believe some strengthening of SAS, then these three hypotheses are really are not all equivalent. So if you assume the non-deterministic strong exponential time hypothesis, these three are not equivalent. And so we really need to work with a different hypothesis. So now we have hypothesis. Uh, let me define fine grained reduction. So intuition is the following. Right? If we can reduce a problem A to problem B, then we want to show that if we can improve problem B, then we can also improve problem A. So let A, B be problems, and let, uh, let little a and little b be their running times. Uh, we say that A is A, B reducible to B if, um, if the following is true. Right? We can think of the reduction as an algorithm that has oracle access to an oracle that solves problem B. And uh, the i oracle code to problem B has the uh, input size n i. Uh, we say A is AB reducible to B if the, there's a reduction that satisfies the following properties. So first thing, we want the reduction itself. So ignoring the oracle, the running time of the oracles, we want the running time of the reduction to be AN to the one minus uh, delta, so faster than AN. And uh, if the running time for each oracle call is BN to the one minus epsilon, we want the total cost over all these oracle costs to also be less than a n to the one minus delta. And if these two are true, then uh, we can conclude that if we can solve b in b n to the one minus epsilon time, we can solve a in a n to the one minus delta time. Both from the definition. And also, uh, fungal induction is Transitive, meaning that if A is AB reducible to B and B is BC reducible to C, then A will be AC reducible to C. And finally, I want to uh, show some known hard conditional hardness results um, this, given this three hypothesis. So really, we can explain the difficulty of all these wide range of problems uh, just uh, using the three core hypotheses, right? So basically, we're actually stuck for the same reasons, same, several reasons. And for three sum, it was traditionally used to show a uh, hardness of computational geometry problems. And uh, it was also used to show hardness of other problems such as stream problems. And APSP, for APSP, it's known that it's n cube, n cube equivalent to a uh, wide range of dense graph problems. So if we can improve over the polynomial improve over the n cube running time for any of these problems, then we can improve uh, all of them. Right. So this is really ideal. And finally, for orthogonal vector, it's known to uh, imply hardness of a wide range of problems, uh, including the longest common subsequence problem we mentioned. 
And for all three of these hypotheses, they are used to show hardness of dynamic problems as well, uh, which we will um, mention later. Of course, there are also other commonly used hardness hypotheses, and we will also mention some uh, in later part of this talk. And now let me uh, switch focus to dynamic graph problems. As we have seen in dynamic graph problems, we need to maintain a graph under some updates, either edge updates or vertex updates. And the queries are of the form uh, whether S can reach T and how many connected components there are and so on. We also saw the definition of partially dynamic and fully dynamic in yesterday's talk. So here's an example of a dynamic graph algorithm that has an efficient solution, which is a dynamic connectivity problem. So here the input is an undirected graph and we need to support edge updates. And for each query, we are given two vertices and we need to answer whether they are connected. The trivial time, trivial algorithm for it just runs um, computer connected components after every update or before every query. And the current best up, uh, data structure or update time and query time are close to log n. And there's also an unconditional lower bound uh, as omega log n. So for this problem, the upper and lower bound upper and the lower bounds essentially match. However, if we slightly change the problem to directed graphs, uh, then this problem becomes uh, much higher, seemingly. So the current best running time uh, is into the 1.41 per update and query. And for unconditional lower bounds, um, uh, there's a recent improvement uh, over the previous log n lower bound. Improve from log n to log, roughly log 1.5n, but still um, there's an exponential gap between the upper and lower bounds. And these running times are still the best known, even if s and t are fixed vertices. We call this the uh, ST rich problem. So we want to use fungrin complexity to explain why directed reachability uh, is much harder than undirected reachability. There are many more examples uh, whose best update and query time uh, has an exponential gap between the best unconditional lower bound. So the first polynomial lower bound for these problems on the natural hypothesis is given by Pachascu, uh, who showed that under the three sum hypothesis, um, uh, all these all the problems such as ST reach and the continent number of points reachable from a single point and the uh, maintain connectivity uh, all require polynomial update and query time, update all query time. And this result was later improved and extended uh, to more problems and also now the lower bound is higher. It's uh, M to the one third uh, instead of M to alpha for some positive alpha. Um, okay, but still, the lower bound and upper bound do not match. Under the strong exponential time hypothesis, there are some matching upper and lower bounds. Uh, for, for instance, for the problem of counting the number of strongly connected components. And also for the approximate diameter problem, the naive update and query bound are uh, order of m times n. So essentially after each update, we have to recompute all potential paths in order to solve this problem. And this m times n is higher than the OM bound for other problems. And for this, there's also a matching lower bound on the sets. Next, I will introduce a new hypothesis that is particularly uh, used particularly often in dynamic graph problems. So this conjecture is about the Boolean matrix multiplication problem. Here we are given two n by n matrices A and B, and we have to compute a n by n matrix, Boolean matrix C, such that the address entry of C is true, if and only if there is some k where A, I, K, and B, K, J are both true. We can use fast matrix multiplication to solve this problem in n to the omega time. Um, 
However, the issue is fast matrix multiplication is often too slow in practice. And so uh, people have come up with the notion of combinatorial algorithms that, uh, that uh, uh, do not really have a formal definition, but intuitively says that uh, these are algorithms that don't use impractical frameworks, such as the algebraic framework for fast matrix multiplication. And the fastest combinatorial algorithm uh, so far runs in n cube over log force n time. So still not polynomially faster than n cube. And the BMM hypothesis states that there are no n to the three minus epsilon time combinatorial algorithm for BMM. Under BMM, uh, there are more matching upper and lower bounds but they only hold for combinatorial algorithms. And so far, we have been using harness conjectures about static algorithms to show harness of dynamic problems. But it would also be natural to show harness of dynamic problems based on the harness of uh, some dynamic problems itself. So this online matrix vector multiplication problem is a, can be viewed as a dynamic version of the BMM problem. And in this problem, we are given uh, n by n Boolean matrix A and n Boolean, Boolean vectors V1 to Vn, given in an online order, and we need to return A times, A times Vi right after Vi has been given. So if V1 to Vn are all given at once initially, then this problem is exactly Boolean matrix multiplication. But now we have to, we can only see Vi plus one after we have computed v, A times Vi. And so far, the best upper bound for this problem uh, is n cube over two to the omega square root log n. So not polynomially faster than n cube. And the OME hypothesis states that this problem requires um, essentially n cube time. So now, under the OME hypothesis, uh, uh, we get also get many tight um, uh, lower bounds, but this time, unlike BMM, they work against arbitrary algorithms. Can I ask a question? Yeah. For the problems where we have a hardness to love assuming BMM, do we have any matrix multiplication like algorithms for them that are not combinatorial, but more efficient than the lower bounds that you get from the BMM hypothesis? Um, Okay, the question is for, for problems that are known to be hard on the BMM, whether they have faster algorithm using faster matrix computer. Or methods like that. Yeah, for some problems they are, um, but it's, in general it's not no fair. Because it's only a hardness result. And so these problems are harder than BMM, but a faster algorithm for BMM do not necessarily imply a faster algorithm for them. Sure, no, the reduction won't work, but I'm just asking. Are there other ways in which you can get? So for some of them, there are. Uh -huh. uh, but for those for which you have lower bounds under OMV, you would refute the hypothesis, and we uh -huh. haven't refuted uh -huh. it yet. So therefore, so I far, see. no. I, I wonder, are they considered candidates for problems where it might be better? For the ones actually... for which you have a BMM reduction, but not an OMV reduction, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. I mean, in fact, uh, I think uh, people have been using, like, if, if a problem has a BMM lower bound, then it's an implication that you might need fast matrix multiplication to get a faster algorithm. So, it's a, so when you uh, consider a new algorithm, you can really think about how to apply fast matrix multiplication. And next, I will mention this uh, very closely related problem called OUMV. And here, uh, we are given an, an Boolean matrix, n by n Boolean matrix A and two n Boolean vectors, uh, u1v1 up to unvn, also given in an online fashion. Now, after each query, we have to uh, return ui transpose times A times vi. Okay. And under the OMV hypothesis, this problem uh, also requires essential n cube time. And in fact, for many problems known to be OMV hard, uh, the reduction is actually from this OUMV problem. I will also mention some other variants of OMV, but I will not formally 
define them. And just to show like in what context you can you, you can pick what kind of hypothesis to use. So there's this um, hinted MV and the hinted UMV problem that were used to show hardness of dynamic matrix inverse and other problems. And also there's the OMV3 hypothesis that was used, used to show hardness of partially dynamic single source stress passes. And for both of them, um, their conjecture running times depend on fast matrix multiplication or fast rectangular matrix multiplication. So if your problem has a running time depending on omega or fast mat rectangular matrix multiplication, uh, you might consider using this hypothesis to show hardness. There's also this OUMVK hypothesis uh, that was used to show hardness of some dynamic geometric problems. And here's the intuition that when the parameter k grows, this problem becomes uh, much harder. So if you have a problem that has a natural parameter, and when that parameter grows, this problem becomes harder, then you can consider using OUMVK as a hardness hypothesis. For instance, such parameter can be uh, the dimension in computational geometry problem or the edge cardinality in some hypergraph problems. So, uh, any questions? Okay. Love them, so we'll talk about some concrete log on constructions. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, for the rest of the talk, I'll give some concrete examples of uh, using a variety of fine grained hypotheses to show uh, lower bounds for some uh, dynamic graph problems. So for most of these examples, they should be very simple. Some of them are not simple, but I'll hide the complicated part and only show you the simple part. Um, so uh, first I'll uh, show you uh, some lower bounds for the ST reachability problem based on two different hypotheses. And the, uh, the first lower bound will be weaker and the second one will be higher. Um, so let's, oh, what happened? Um, okay, let's recall the definition of the dynamic ST uh, reachability problem. You have a directed graph and have, uh, you have a fixed source node and fixed sync node. And updates are edge insertions and deletions, and you want to query whether you can go from S to T in the directed graph. So uh, first I'll show a, a lower bound based on either the three sum hypothesis or the APSB hypothesis uh, with a lower bound of uh, M to the one third, where M is the number of edges in the graph. And here, instead of starting from the hypothesis themselves, I will uh, start from this nice uh, intermediate problem called all edge triangle problem. So in this problem, you are given an undirected graph G, and for each edge in the graph, you want to decide whether this edge belongs to one, uh, at least one of the triangles in the graph. So uh, in this example, you have one triangle. So the answers for these three edges are yes, and the answers for the other edges are no. Okay, and there's a very uh, influential paper by Patrashku in 2010, which showed a three-sum lower bound for this OH triangle problem. The statement is that on the graph with maximum degree root n, uh, solving this OH triangle problem requires at least quadratic time, uh, assuming three-sum. So here uh, we can easily observe that this uh, running time bound is tight because the number of edges is uh, m equals n to the uh, 1.5 because the degree is root n. And you can just, uh, for each edge, enumerate all the root n many neighbors to decide if this edge belongs to the triangle. And the total time is n squared. And you can also uh, uh, write this bound in terms of m, which will be m to the 4 thirds. OK. And uh, so the, uh, the this result uh, is very useful. and. Um, most of the uh, graph lower bounds based on threesome are actually uh, proved using this result. And more recently, uh, this threesome hypothesis uh, has been weakened to a more believable hypothesis called exact triangle, uh, which I won't define here. But uh, if you falsify this hypothesis, then you will falsify both threesome and the APSP hypothesis. OK. So in the next slide, I will uh, show how to reduce uh, a sure reduction uh, uh, for the uh, ST reachability problem. And uh, I'll solve uh, OH triangle using the uh, data structure for solving ST reachability. 
And this will imply a three sum or APSP based lower bounds for ST reachability. Okay, so the uh, reduction is uh, very simple. So let's say we have an OH triangle instance and we create a dynamic ST reachability instance by uh, creating three vertex copies and uh, uh, additionally a fixed source S and a fixed uh, sink T. And uh, uh, we'll connect directed edges between V1 and V2 and V2 and V3. So these edges are uh, just copies of the edges in the uh, triangle instance, but we'll make them uh, directed from left to right. So uh, more precisely, uh, between V1 and V2, I'll connect the edge between the copy of U in V1 and the copy of V in V2, if and only if UV edge uh, uh, is uh, in the uh, original triangle instance input graph. And I'll do the same thing for uh, between V2 and V3. And now uh, let's solve the OI triangle problem. For each edge x, y, we want to decide if there exists a triangle that uh, contains x, y. Or in other words, we want to decide if there is a two path connecting x and y going through some uh, intermediate node z. And to answer this question, we can just use our data structure for ST reachability. We uh, add edges between uh, S and the copy of X in V1. And then we, we also add an edge from uh, Y, the copy of Y in V3 to the sync node T. And because we only uh, connect directed edges from left to right, so you can easily see that uh, uh, there's a, a two path from X to Y if and only if uh, there's a, a directed path from S to T in this uh, reachability instance. So by querying whether you can reach T from S, you can know whether X, Y edge is inside a triangle in the OI triangle instance. So we record the answer and then we uh, remove these added uh, edges to prepare for the next question. And we repeat, repeat this for all the input edges. So uh, we perform uh, two uh, edge updates and one query for each of the M edges. So there are order M operations in total. So if we can solve uh, S reachability in faster M to the one third per uh, operation, then we would violate this uh, hardening results for all these triangle based on three sum or APSP. So this is a very uh, simple reduction, uh, but the bound is uh, kind of weak. So next I'll show a, a uh, lower bound for the same problem, but based on a different hypothesis, the OMV hypothesis. So this is a, a theorem uh, in the paper by Hansinger et al. We show that if you can solve S reachability in uh, less than uh, root M update time and uh, uh, less than M query time, then you would uh, falsify the OUMV hypothesis. And by the equivalence between OUMV and OMV hypothesis proved in this paper, you will also falsify uh, the OMV hypothesis. Okay, you can compare this with the naive algorithm that does nothing during updates, but performs a full DFS during queries. And you can see that uh, the query time uh, is tight in the sense that if you want to keep your update time unchanged, then you, ha you cannot improve your query time, uh, assuming the OMV hypothesis. Okay, so uh, let me show the reduction, which is also very simple. So let's recall the uh, definition of the OUMV problem. You have a fixed Boolean uh, matrix M, and then you receive uh, a, a bunch of vector pairs, uh, U, U and V, and uh, um, for each of the ve vector pairs, you need to answer U transpose times M times V uh, right, after, right after you receive this uh, uh, vector pair, and you need to output the answer before you receive the next question. And the, the hypothesis is that the OUMV problem requires a total time of n cubed, or in other words, uh, amortized time of uh, n squared uh, uh, for, each, uh, for each vector pair. And here, uh, let's see uh, what it means for uh, the answer of uh, u transpose mv to, equal to, to be equal to one. It means that uh, there must exist an entry in the uh, matrix M. Uh, let's say it's entry uh, on the i row and jth column. Uh, it's a one, and also on the vector, the ith coordinate is one. In, in the vector u, the ith coordinate is one, and in the vector v, the jth coordinate is one. So 
the answer is one if and only if you can find this uh, entry ij. So based on this, we can easily design a reduction. Uh, it's very similar to the previous reduction. We also have fixed S and T, and we have this uh, a, a bipartite graph in the middle connected with direct edges from left to right. And adjacency matrix of this bipartite graph should be equal to the uh, matrix M. And for each uh, vector pair UV, uh, what you do is to you connect uh, an edge from S to I, if and only if the ith coordinate in the vector U is equal to one. And you do the same thing uh, for uh, the vector V. You connect edges from, from the second part to the sync node T. And uh, you can easily observe that the answer uh, U transpose MV equals one, if and only if in this constructed graph, you can uh, go from S to T. So by querying this ST reachability uh, data structure, you can know the answer to the UMV question. And then uh, after you know the answer, you, you just remove these uh, added edges and prepare for the uh, next uh, UV vector pair. And let's count how many operations uh, we need in this reduction. So for each uh, UV vector pair, we need to perform N edge updates uh, on the left-hand side and right-hand side. And we, we only need one as the reachability query. So this means that if we could have a data structure that has amortized uh, time less than n per update and less than n squared per query, then it would uh, imply an OUMV algorithm with a truly subcubic time, which would falsify the OUMV hypothesis. And uh, because this is a dense graph, so you can also uh, rewrite the bounds in terms of the number of edges m. So this would be a lower bound of roughly root m, uh, root m update time and uh, m query time. Okay. So on the next slide, I'll show you this simple reduction can actually be adapted to give you lower bounds for some other uh, different um, dynamic graph problems in particular, the undirected shortest path problem. So, so uh, we have just seen this reduction uh, that shows a, a lower bound for fully dynamic X reachability. But also we can uh, use the same reduction to show a lower bound for the undirected SD shortest path problem. So in this problem, you have a dynamic undirected graph and you want to query the, sh uh, the distance between S and T. So what do you do? You just take the same reduction and replace all the directed edges by uh, undirected edges. And earlier we said that the uh, U transpose and V equals one if and only if you can uh, reach T from S by going from left to right. And here you just replace this condition by uh, whether the shortest distance between S and T is equal to three. So this is because uh, in, in this graph, uh, the only valid uh, path is those uh, are those uh, path from from the left to right uh, that only uh, takes uh, three edges. And if you go from S to T with the invalid path, then it has to have some zigzags, and the distance will be larger than three. So you can see that uh, this is a uh, uh, equivalent to whether uh, you transpose MV equals one. So this means that you can uh, solve the OMV question by asking the, uh, the, the distance between S and T. So this gives you a, a lower bound for this shortest path question. And you can also go further and say that because in this graph, we only need to distinguish whether the distance between S and T is equal to three or at least five. Because uh, this is a bipartite graph, so, so distance four cannot happen because we know S and T are on opposite sides of the bipartite graph. So this means that we actually show a, a five thirds minus delta approximation uh, version of this problem uh, has the same lower bound. Okay, so this kind of uh, uh, extends the, the this uh, lower bound. And another way to extend this lower bound is to uh, show that actually uh, the incremental version of this SD shortest path problem also has the same lower bound. And this is a, a good exercise. You can uh, think about it. And I, I put a hint down there. And th these two extensions are the 
uh, all from the uh, Hanzinger et al. paper. Okay. Um, and uh, in particular, this incremental uh, lower bounds matches the ES tree algorithm, which can maintain a BFS tree in order n amortized time in the incremental or decremental setting. Okay. Um, now let's look at this approximate uh, lower bound. A natural question is to ask whether we can show some lower bounds for higher approximation ratio. So the problem with this uh, simple reduction is that if we allow a higher approximation ratio, then you can have uh, some zigzag paths that do not actually correspond to a triangle, but uh, because of your high approximation ratio, they will become false positives. So, so on this slide, I will briefly talk about some very recent advances in fine grain complexity without any proofs. So let's look at this uh, K approximate distance over course problem. So it's slightly different from the earlier problem in that we uh, allow query distance between U and V for any U and V, not just a fixed uh, source and sink. And we focus on, on undirected graphs. So this problem has a, a celebrated uh, upper bound by Thorup and Zwick. Um, you can uh, build a distance oracle with 2k minus one approximation ratio uh, in m times n to the one over k pre-processing time. And you can allow uh, uh, querying distance with this approximation ratio in constant time. And uh, this distance oracle is static, but it was later extended to decremental setting with a slight parameter loss by Chechik in two, uh, 2018. And very recently, um, there's a lower bound based on the OH triangle uh, problem, or you can base it on a threesum or APSP. This was by Abu Brinman, Hori, and Zamir, which shows that if you want a static uh, k approx distance oracle with the subpolynomial query time, then the pre-processing time for uh, constructing this distance oracle has to uh, take m to the one plus one over some constant times k. So if you compare this upper bound and lower bound, you will see that the dependency on k is uh, right up to a constant uh, on, on the exponent. Um, and this constant was later improved uh, uh, in stock 23. And now the, uh, the gap between upper bound and lower bound is only a uh, two factor. So this is a very non-trivial uh, result. And the rough idea is that uh, if you look at the uh, reduction from OH triangle to approximate shortest path, you can see that all the uh, false positives are those uh, cycles that have uh, uh, length order K. So the idea is to show that even in OH triangle instance with very few uh, length order K cycles, we can still prove that it is hard based on threesome. And then using some uh, uh, kind of uh, techniques called cycle removal, we can uh, establish this result. Okay. Okay, uh, so the, the final example I'll show is uh, uh, a strong ETH based lower bound for maintaining strongly connected components. So in a static setting, if you want to find all the strongly connected components in the directed graph, there's a very nice algorithm that solves it in linear time in the number of edges. In a dynamic setting, if we want to maintain the uh, SCCs uh, uh, with the edge insertions and edge deletions, uh, there are like two types of query that we can uh, consider. The first type of query is whether U and V are in the same SCC, and the second type of query is how many SCCs does the current graph have? And uh, for all the known algorithms uh, that can solve query one, they also solve query two, although we don't know any black box reduction between these two kinds of queries. Okay, so now let's look at some previous uh, upper bounds in the partially dynamic setting. So assume we want a query time, uh, constant time, and we look at the, um, total update time of the algorithms in the partially dynamic setting. In the incremental setting, uh, there are a lot of nice algorithms, in particular in the dense regime where the number of edges is uh, quadratic in N, then 
uh, there is this uh, total time n square log n algorithm, which is amortized uh, log n. And in the sparse regime, uh, uh, currently the best algorithm has m to the one third amortized time. And then in the decremental setting, uh, there is a result in uh, with total time uh, m times polylog. So we can see that in the partially dynamic setting, uh, there are non-trivial upper bounds, both for deletion, uh, for, for decremental setting and for uh, incremental setting. But in the fully dynamic setting, we allow both insertions and deletions. And the best known solution is to just recompute the SECs after each update. And uh, the result by Abud and uh, Vasilevska Williams in 2014 says that indeed this trivial algorithm is optimal under the strong ETH hypothesis. Any fully dynamic algorithm that can uh, support queries of the type is the number of SECs at uh, greater than two uh, needs to have amortized update or query time at, at least linear in M. So we might as well just recompute all the SECs after each update. Okay, so next I'll show the uh, re reduction for proving this theorem. So uh, we'll start from the, the OV problem to the uh, number of SEC greater than two uh, queries. So recall that the OV pro in the OV problem, we have N binary vectors with very small dimensions. The dimension D is N to the little of one or even a polylog N. And we want to decide if there are two uh, vectors that are orthogonal. Or in other words, the, the, co the one coordinates are disjoint. So the reduction will be uh, of the uh, of following uh, template. So we first have a pre-processing stage. And then for each vector in the input, we'll have a, a stage for, for this vector. Uh, the first step of this stage is to insert uh, D many edges. And then we'll query whether the number of SECs is greater than two. And just based on the answer of this query, we can decide if uh, this vector V is orthogonal to anyone else. And then we delete these added uh, D edges and uh, uh, repeat this for loop. And we can see that in total, there are n times the uh, number of updates, and there are n queries. And the number of edges ever inserted to the graph is at most uh, order n times d, which is also uh, almost linear in n. So this means that uh, if, uh, if we can have a, a truly sublinear uh, time per operation, then we would get a subquadratic algorithm for OV, which would violate strong ETH. Okay, so, so this is the plan. And now let's see how to uh, fill in the details. So the, uh, the graph after pre-processing will be uh, like this. So let's parse it. So we have uh, uh, two parts. On the left-hand side, we have uh, a bunch of nodes where each uh, node encodes one vector. And in the middle, we have uh, uh, a smaller number of nodes which encode the coordinates. And we additionally also have a separate node S and uh, another node T. And we connect edges from the left, left part to S. Um, and we also um, encode the, the input vectors using edges between uh, the left part and the middle part. So, for, for each vector u and each coordinate c, uh, we connect the edge from c to u, so from right to left, if and only if the, the c coordinate of the u vector equals one. Okay, so, so this is the definition of the graph after the pre-processing stage. And then we start uh, a stage for each of the vector v, and we want to tell whether v is orthogonal to uh, any other vectors. And to do this, we first connect edges from S to the nodes that encode the coordinates uh, in the following way. Uh, we connect uh, from S to E if and only if the coordinate E of vector V equals one. And then we also connect edges, uh, bidirectional edges between this uh, middle part and uh, the other node T. 
and the definition here is that um, we, co we connect uh, C and T if and only if the T coordinate, uh, sorry, the C coordinate and uh, of the V vector equals zero. So basically we, we look at the, uh, the coordinates of vector V. So there are one coordinates and zero coordinates. We, we deal with them separately. And we, uh, based on these coordinates, we connect these edges. And then let's uh, analyze the uh, strongly connected components of this graph. So the first observation is that uh, there's no path from S to C if the C coordinate of V is zero. So th this is because we only connect from S to the coordinate nodes uh, that are one coordinate. So for zero coordinates, we don't co connect edges. So even if we go to some one coordinate node and uh, go to the left and then uh, uh, go on some other path, then, then we can only go back to S, which doesn't help us uh, to get to uh, C. Okay, so this is the first observation. And the second observation is that there's no path from S to T. This is because the only way to uh, reach T is to go through those uh, coordinate vertices that are connected to T. But these vertices are uh, those that have zero coordinates. So again, we have no path from S to T. Okay, the, the third observation is that T is in an SCC with all the coordinates C uh, that are zero. Uh, uh, this easily follows from the definition of these edges between the coordinate nodes and uh, T. And the next observation is that uh, S is in an SCC with uh, all the coordinates C such that uh, the, the C coordinate of V is equal to one. And uh, so, so the, the SCCs are something like this. So this is because the way we connect edges uh, from the uh, coordinate, coordinate nodes to the left, we, we connect them if uh, uh, the coordinates are one. So if they are one, then they are connected and they are incorporated into, into this SCC that contains S. And finally, we can see that uh, U and S are in the same SCC if and only if there is a coordinate C such that uh, both u of c and v of c are equal to one. Or in other words, if and only if u and v are not orthogonal, uh, their one coordinates are, are overlapping. So in this way, we can just uh, uh, distinguish between the two scenarios where there are just two SECs or there are strictly more than two SECs. So in a case where th there are only two SECs, then it must be that uh, T is contained in one SCC and S is contained uh, in another SCC and these two SECs partition the whole graph. And if it's not the case, then it means that there's some um, leftover uh, vector nodes and these are the nodes that uh, are, um, are, are, are not uh, sorry, uh, they are orthogonal to uh, the vector V. So by uh, counting how many SCCs does this graph have, we can tell whether V is orthogonal to any of the other vectors. Okay. So this finishes the description of one stage of the reduction. And we repeat the, this stage for each of the vector V. And the, in the end, we can tell whether uh, the, the entire OV instance is a yes instance or no instance. Why is four pro here? Item four, why is it? Uh, item four? Yeah, because you only have edges in one direction. Uh, I mean, it's technical, we can skip it. Uh, so this is like cyclic. You can go from here to here and here and then back to here. So it's not a, just a one direction. But that edge depends on whether u at that coordinate is one or two. right. If uh, v of c is one, uh, okay. s is in.
um, so v appears on the left as well. So you go to s to the coordinate in which v is one, and then you can go oh, back okay. to v. Oh, okay. V is also. Yeah, v is also on the left. So it's not like uh, bipartite type. Uh, the orthogonal vectors problem. It's equivalent in in the case where the, there's a single set and when there's two okay, sets. Okay, so here v is also on the left. Yeah, so v is on the left. Last case, right, when uh, m is small, right. does this rule out something like, I don't know, n to the 1.5 of the time? Yeah. Um, they are already upper bound with m to the one third uh, per operation. So we cannot, cannot hope to get lower bounds higher than the existing upper bound. This is what is upper bound? Uh, let me go back. Oh, sorry. The upper bounds are for the uh, partially uh, dynamic. Oh, so, so, what's your question? Is your question whether we can prove lower bounds for uh, for dense graphs? Yeah. Oh, I see. Um, so, so you, you say uh, something like. And then to the one point one ruler, properly that. Um, there might be matrix multiplication based algorithms. For the yeah, I, I don't know if there. Are. Sometimes putting these bounds in terms of M is a little misleading, right? Because it only works in the sparse regime in. And when you do upper bound, sometimes you use n, like, like for example, the n squared. So it feels like the problem is closed, but maybe it's not completely closed. Um, yeah, as Virginia said, in a dense regime, you can use um, matrix multiplication to compute the transitive closure. Um, which might also help you uh, compute SCCs. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not super sure. Maybe matrix multiplication can help you in the dense region. Okay, thanks for the question. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think this is the end of the talk. Thank you. Questions? So the SEC problem, it's are there two or more than two components? What have you just asked? Is there a cycle or not in the fully dynamic scenario? You know anything about that problem? Uh, I think if you can solve fully dynamic uh, cycle detection, at least you can solve the always triangle problem, uh, which has m to the one third lower bound. But I don't know if there are any higher lower bound than that. Are there any? Slightly different, but maybe related question. What happens if you're doing batch updates? Do any of these results say anything about batch updates rather than individual? That is, and um, so all these. Th this um, one is linear already, but I wonder if you could get some kind of linear bound for a, some other problem for a batch update situation, and how many updates would force you to spend linear time, something like that. Yeah, I think uh, all these reductions described here, they do not distinguish between the batch setting and the, 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 the real online setting because you already know all the updates beforehand. Uh, yeah, I think it's interesting to see if we can get any like higher lower bounds in the, in the online setting that, ha that are higher in the batch setting. I, I'm not so very sure. Questions? All right, let's thank the speakers again. Mm -hmm. so,
so, so that's it for the regular uh, uh, workshop planning for the day. But don't stray too 